Rupert, science, physics is based upon the fact that whatever is true now, here, is true forever, everywhere. The laws of, of physics. But some people say that some of them may be changing over time. Some cosmologists try to explore that. What do you think about the laws of nature, physics? Uh, do they change? Well, I don't see why not. Uh, we live in a radically evolutionary universe. The idea that the laws of nature are completely fixed is a hangover from a 17th century theology where God made up the laws of nature. They're called laws because God was like an emperor and um, everything had to obey them because he was also being all-powerful, a kind of universal law enforcement agency. Um, that metaphor is incredibly anthropocentric. Um, it got built into the foundations of science and it's carried on ever since with most scientists never questioning it. The laws of nature are universal, they're immutable, uh, they're omnipotent. These are properties of God in the traditional theological sense. They've carried over to the laws of nature. Many scientists have eliminated God from their world view, but the laws of nature are kind of hangover, <laughs> the ghost and the machine of uh, mechanistic science. So the idea they're fixed is purely an assumption, it's not a fact. Um, and the idea that they were fixed right at the beginning of the universe, billions of years ago, uh, when there was no one around to observe things, is a massive act of faith. Um, as my friend Terence McKenna used to say, modern science is based on the principle of give us one free miracle and we'll explain the rest. <laughs> and the free miracle is the emergence of the entire universe and all the laws that govern it from nothing in a single instant. <laughs> so um, I think this is a gigantic assumption. And in an evolutionary universe, why shouldn't the laws evolve? If we look at the law metaphor is based on human laws, which apply only in civilized societies. Tribal societies have customs. Um, and laws do evolve. The laws of the US and of Britain are not the same today as they were 100 years ago. So if we really want to stick with that human analogy, it implies evolution. But I think law is a really bad metaphor anyway, um, because it implies that um, inanimate objects are following something that's a, a human device. And C.S. Lewis once said that to say a stone falls to earth because it's obeying a law makes it a man and even a citizen. Um, <laughs> so I prefer the metaphor of habit. I think that nature uh, evolves, the whole of nature evolves, the regularities of nature evolve along with the evolving universe. New habits appear. And what we're observing are not laws, but regularities based on habit that become universal habits um, as they develop. And so I see them as evolving, as developing, not being fixed right from the beginning. We have not a shred of evidence that all the laws of nature were all in place at the moment of the Big Bang. And also the idea that the constants of nature, the so-called constants, are constant. That again is an assumption, a hangover from an older physics, a pre-evolutionary physics. Uh, and this has got built into the thinking of many scientists, just as an unconscious habit. It's a habit carried over from a previous cosmology. What evidence might there be to support this? Well, I mean, what in, if you're looking at things that have happened billions of times before, the habits are so fixed, they behave as if they're governed by eternal laws. So that's the limiting case becomes the same. Um, where you get a difference is when you look at new phenomena, new chemicals that are made for the first time, new crystals, new forms of behavior in animals, new ideas, new human skills, new human abilities, new forms of organization. Um, according to the view I'm putting forward, each of these through repetition should become more habitual. That means it should happen more easily, more probably. Uh, they become more probable. So. Crystals should get easier to crystallize all around the world after they've first yeah. been made. The more people that make them, the, the easier they should get to crystallize everywhere else. There's good evidence that actually happens from chemists. Um, chemists have known this for a long time. They don't explain it in terms of morphic resonance. The conventional explanation in chemistry is that this happens because fragments of previous crystals get carried from lab to lab on the beards of migrating chemists. Um, so. I mean, oddly enough, they take that kind of anecdote very seriously. Um, and no doubt chemists could carry fragments of crystals from lab to lab. But I'm saying that even if you exclude migrating chemists from the lab, and even if you filter dust particles from the atmosphere, this 
greater ease of crystallization should still occur. You mentioned morphic resonance. Yes. What is that? Well, morphic resonance is my own hypothesis to try and explain this principle of evolving habit in nature. Habits depend on memory, usually unconscious memory. Your habits and my habits depend on a memory of what's happened before, but we don't remember every instance. The whole point of habit is is unconscious memory. I think nature is full of unconscious memory that uh, underlies these habits. Then how does it work? Well, my hypothesis is that similar things influence subsequent similar patterns of activity on the basis of similarity, that similarities connect things across time and space from the past to the present. And that I call morphic resonance. What's similar is the pattern of activity. Everything's vibratory, everything's rhythmic in nature, atoms, molecules, cells, organisms, all of them have multiple rhythms, uh, patterns of vibration in space and time. Those patterns resonate across space and time to give this kind of memory. And this would be at what level? Are they at the atomic level, or subatomic level, species of animals, or group activities of human beings? There's so many different ways that there are regularities in the world. Well, all of those levels, I think, have morphic resonance. Inside my body and yours, there are innumerable water molecules, for example, and those have hydrogen and oxygen atoms. The structure of the hydrogen and oxygen atoms based on resonance from previous hydrogen and oxygen going back billions of years. Water molecules have been around for billions of years too. Those have their own habits. and then, But they're organized in, in cells together with lots of proteins, DNA, other molecules. All of those have habits and structures that are based on resonance. The cells themselves, the organs, the tissues, the whole body, all have rhythms and all at their own level are resonating. So there are different morphic resonances at each level of the, of the scientific hierarchy? Each, each one has its own? Yes. Because the traditional understanding in a reduction in sense is you can explain water molecules by going down to the behavior of atoms and them going then further to the component parts of atoms. And you can, if we knew enough, be able to go bottoms up and to be able to explain the behavior. Yes. Well, I think that kind of reductionism is a fantasy. I mean, no one ever does it. You don't explain the liquid prop- properties of water by quantum physics of hydrogen and oxygen atoms. Well, because, Nobody in practice does that. Correct, but, th- but they say they can, ultimately. Well, they can't. But they tell us that sometime in the future they might be able to... That's an act of faith. It's not a scientific proof. If somebody comes along and says, I can explain the whole of nature in terms of a few fundamental laws of physics, predicting the behavior of an entire organism like a fruit fly just from knowing the atoms inside it. Okay, dream on. I mean, this is, this is a, a kind of fantasy and people can't deliver on this. And they might persuade people that they'll do it at some time in the future. But this is what the philosopher Sir Karl Popper called promissory materialism. It involves issuing promissory notes against future explanations, and what's more undated promissory notes. So, I mean, I can see that's an act of faith of the reductionist, uh, but that needn't persuade anyone if they actually are interested in evidence. And actually, it's not true that science works in terms of reductionism. People in practice study things at their own level. Yeah, sure, Sociologists sure. don't study atoms inside me and you. They study the behavior of societies. And when cosmologists study the entire universe, they don't start with particles. They start with the fields of nature, including the gravitational field, which is a top-down field. You can't have a bottom-up gravitational field. The gravitational field is the universal field of the universe. It's the all-inclusive field of all nature. And you can't get more holistic than that. So um, I think that a kind of holistic perspective, looking at systems at their own level, is in fact what goes on in all branches of science. So you would believe these morphic fields that express this morphic resonance occur at all levels of, of reality and uh, interact with whether there must be infinite numbers of these. Not infinite numbers. I mean, there's finite numbers of species sure. in the world. I mean, we're here amongst countless <laughs> species of beetles <laughs> and other insects. Right. There's, but it's still finite. Yes. And um, the, the, there are all these different species. All these cabinets are full of, <laughs> uh, of, of them. There's drawers here full of these different beetles and so forth. Um, and 
these, each of these is a different species. It, all the members in that species are recognizably part of the species. That's why we have type specimens here at Oxford. Um, all around the world, you can find millions of beetles of each species. Sure. So what we find in nature is there's certain patterns, recurrent patterns of organization. Each species is recognizably part of that pattern. Each kind of molecule or each kind of crystal has a, a pattern. There are millions of individuals all sharing in that form. The key thing is to explain those common forms that many individuals share. All giraffes share a common giraffe form. Um, so morphic fields are, the, 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 what I'm talking about is the patterns of organization at each level of nature, each of which with a, has a kind of memory. Is there any predictive power for this? Oh, sure. There's lots of predictions. I mean, the predictions are that if you train uh, an animal to learn a new trick in one part of the world, if you train hundreds of them or thousands of them, it should be easier for others to learn it elsewhere. It should be easier for people to do to solve the Times crossword puzzle tomorrow uh, rather than today. It's today's crossword puzzle after so many people have done it today. Uh, there's actually evidence that things do get easier if lots of people have done them. Uh, you have to eliminate normal sensory information, of course, to do rigorous tests on this. But this is a highly testable theory that makes a lot of predictions.